All right, perfect. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our, oh my gosh, I think this is number four now uh, in our six-part webinar series. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Kenny Turner. I am with the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, and I am joined by my colleague, Antonia Castro. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here today. And I'm so pumped to be the hype girl for today and really be the one controlling the conversation, the chat and questions. So we're so very excited to continue to learn because these past couple weeks have been filled with so much good information. And we're so excited. Yeah. And you know, what? At first week we did. I mean, we talked about AI. We've talked about social capital. We've talked about websites, uh, and today, right? What what makes and what's make these uh, these webinars so awesome is that we're partnering with Nicolette College to offer these amazing um, these amazing workshops uh, for for the community college community, for the entrepreneur community, um, for individuals who just want to get better at each and every one of these topics. And I've learned a lot, you know during this journey so far. So today we're gonna to keep it rolling. <laughs> we have, uh, it won't stop. The energy is gonna keep going. We're gonna be uh, filled with a lot of great information. And I have had the pleasure actually of sitting under Heather's um, workshops in the past and I've never walked, not walked away with something. So okay. Heather, I am so happy you're here. Guys, Heather is the co-founder of Q Career. I'm going to allow her to do a soft introduction of herself. What is Q Career? You know, who is Heather Wetzler? And what are we going to learn today about sales? So we're totally excited to have you with us, Heather. We're going to give you a virtual round of applause for joining us. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I hand it over. I hand it over to you. Well, great. Thank you so much, Kenny. Um, my name is Heather Wetzler, and I am the co-founder of Q Career. And Q Career is an education, technology, and workforce development company startup. And I'm in charge of doing sales for it. But before I started my own company, I actually worked in sales, uh, specifically in internet advertising sales, for 16 years. Uh, I sold everything from Hearst Media Publications to a website called Deviant Art, which was for artists and anything in between. So one thing about sales um, is that it's, you know, it's really for everyone. And I'm going to tell you why <laughs> uh, as we jump into this screen. So, <clears throat> so basically, um, you know, uh, you guys can see my screen, right? Right. So Muhammad Yunus said, all human beings are entrepreneurs. When we were in caves, we were all self-employed, finding our food, feeding ourselves. That's where human history began. As civilization came, we suppressed it. We became labor because they stamped us as labor. You are labor. We forgot we were entrepreneurs. I would actually take that further and say that we are all salespeople. And I say that because no matter what you're doing, and people don't think of sales this way. When people think of sales, unfortunately, a lot of time they'll think of used car salesmen or someone trying to push a product on them. But really, no matter, and this is why sales skills will never go to waste, which is why I think everyone should take a sales class um and interact with different sales components but no matter what you're doing you're always selling something if you're interviewing for a job you're selling yourself and if you're working at a large corporation internally you always have to sell stuff you're either selling something to your boss or you're selling something to your team a project that maybe you want to do so really we're all salespeople. so it's really in everyone's best interest to not only embrace that, but also to learn how to become good at it, right? Because I think a lot of people don't like sales and they'll make excuses. Sometimes it's like introvert, extrovert type stuff. But really, if you learn the skills and you become good at it, um, then it could be a lot of fun. So, you know, if you're starting your entrepreneurship journey um, with Nifty, perhaps, um, you know, you're going to have to learn or your entrepreneurship journey, wherever you're going to have to learn 
to sell your product, but also yourself, um, because there might be times where you're raising money and while you're selling your product there, but you're also selling yourself. And then there are times where you're just selling your product to hopefully a new audience, but you have to convince people that you're going to be around for a while and why they should support you. Um, and if you're going to be, let's say you're going to be like a, a, you know, your entrepreneurship journey, you're going to be a small business owner, entrepreneur, such as like a mechanic or a hairstylist or a dry cleaner, you're still selling yourself as trustworthy. Either maybe you're a new addition to a neighborhood, or if someone comes in that's new and you're more established, you know, you're going to have to redo your messaging there as well. So, you know, really regardless of what your job or career ends up being, sales skills will never go to waste. Um, and, you know, one could argue that some people need sales skills to be successful in life. Um, so here, um, I'm going to break down the sales presentation into, you know, really what makes a good salesperson, um, some tips and tricks, and then we'll touch on hard and soft skills. Um, so again, like I was saying earlier, sales really gets a bad rap. Some people think of it, you know, the used car salesman. But really, um, what sales is, again, having done this for 16 years and mostly for startups that people have never heard of, um, is it's really problem solving. So, and what really makes a good salesperson is being able to solve someone's problem. So if you reframe that as opposed to, oh, I'm a used car salesman. Well, I mean, think about like why people are coming to look at used cars, right? I mean, they're, they need a car. They're looking at used cars for a reason. So you're going to try to sell, you know, sell them a product that hopefully you think they need. And, you know, customer service is so key to being a good salesperson. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you found a gap in the market, right? And your product and service wants to fill that gap. So what makes a great salesperson and customer service is you need soft skills to be good at customer service. Um, so in today's workshop, as I said, I'm gonna, I wanna go over the hard and soft skills. Um, and we'll start with really the seven stages of a sales cycle. So number one, and I'll go into these, I'm not gonna go into every single one in depth, um, but I'll probably tackle the first three because that'll make the most sense, right? That the follow-up and development relationship and referrals <laughs> further down the road wouldn't make sense for this workshop. So I'll go over prospecting and qualifying prospects and, and contacts. But really, I mean, the first thing you do as a salesperson is, is prospect, and then you're going to qualify those prospects and leads and then contact and present to that person. And then you're going to get into handling, addressing and handling objections nurturing that potential client, closing the deal. And then there's always the follow-up, developing the relationship and referrals. Um, so prospecting, uh, obviously one prospect is never enough. You're gonna, in order to be successful, you're gonna have to have multiple prospects. So, you know, what that is going to come down to is qualifying a prospect, right? So let's say we have this product and then it's, you know, is there a need for it? Maybe they need it, you know, but can't afford it, right? So this is where we're trying to figure out. So as a salesperson too, you're trying to, especially like when you're going out, you know, in the very beginning, usually they'll, they'll call it low hanging fruit, but you want to start to close deals as soon as possible. So when you're qualifying prospects, you're gonna look at need and affordability. So, you know, what you really wanna do is create an interest and turn that interest into a conversation that eventually leads to a sale. Um, you know, at the end of this uh, uh, presentation, I have another funnel that looks like the other one, but basically it kind of shows how many prospects you kind of need you know, to get to one sale, you know, so going a lot back to the lines that, you know, one prospect never enough, right? We'll kind of do the funnel of like, you know, you make this many calls and then you outline like this many people. But, you know, when you want to think about it is it's a numbers game. So let's say basically you probably have to make 60 to 100 calls to have like four meaningful conversations. So there, um, and also when you're thinking about sales too, there's, you know, people and entrepreneurs often talk about the gig economy and the gig economy has become really popular. 
And there's actually sales gig jobs now that people like may or may not know about, but like I know of this one company, it's called COPP, K-O-P-P -P, Consulting. And basically what they do, like their, um, their uh, whole thing is, it's called a door opener, right? So they'll have either startups or even some other companies that have been around for a while, but have maybe gotten stale. And they just literally have people cold calling to set up meetings. So, I mean, and the cold callers will get paid like 55 or $60 an hour, right? And they might do like 15 hours in a week. And then you organize, you know, how you want to do that. And you're just cold calling people. And sometimes the client has a list and sometimes they don't. But the whole thing is to set up a meeting, right? So that's where the sales prospecting, that's an example. And then you get paid per meeting that you have, right? So when you're looking at sales prospects, the most important thing is you want to like create an interest and turn that interest into a conversation and then eventually a sale. So you're going to develop um, and determine which prospects are more likely to buy your product or service, you know, and start with qualifying the lead and tracking them through a, CR, a CRM. So earlier in the presentation, I mentioned there's hard skills and soft skills. So a CRM is a tool and we'll consider that a hard skill, such as a HubSpot or Salesforce. And actually, if you go to HubSpot or Salesforce.com, you could start to take some of their training to learn the CRM for free. So Salesforce, especially if you have a, um, a college email address. So for Salesforce, there's something called Trail, Trails Head. And as you advance, they give you badges and you could display those badges on your LinkedIn. And I think if you're looking to go into sales, um, it's really good to, to have some of these badges so that people know that you know how to use, every sales organization uses a CRM. We use HubSpot, my, my startup, because it's cheaper. <laughs> Most companies use Salesforce. Um, but obviously, as a startup founder, we're really conscious of, um, you know, of a, uh, of a, uh, um, you know, of a budget, but most large companies, every large organization I worked for always uses Salesforce and they customize Salesforce. So no Salesforce is the same, but at least if you know how to put the basics, that's good. But for you as entrepreneurs, like even if you can't afford, you know, the cheaper HubSpot right now, keeping a Google doc, you know, and tracking and entering the data, that's what the CRM tool is really doing. So as you're prospecting, you're entering the person's name, address all their contact information, and then you're keeping track of how many times you've called them, how many times you've emailed them, if you connected. So the CRM is also, you know, the soft skill would be organization, right? So it's helping you organize all the people that you've reached out to. And let's say you're, you know, while you're starting your entrepreneurship journey, let's say that you're looking for a job. I even think using a HubSpot you know, is a good way to even show employers um, your due diligence. So we've talked to, like we were talking to one intern and he basically, you know, instead of entering clients, he was entering the jobs that he applied to and then the contacts. And then if he's reached them, like it was a hiring manager, but again, showing people that you've interacted with these tools, you know, if you're looking for a sales job while you're starting your entrepreneurship journey, is showing initiative and also, again, every sales company requires that you use this. And that's one thing they don't love to teach. Um, they usually expect people to kind of walk in knowing HubSpot and Salesforce. Um, so the type of sales prospecting, so cold call and emails, um, referrals, social media, website leads, direct mail and flyers, um, and events and networking. So no one likes cold calling. I have one friend actually, he loves cold calling. <laughs> I, I think she's super unique though. Um, for her though, it's like a game. Like, can she get someone on the phone? Um, but I would say, you know, when email first came out, I know I'm older, uh, but when email first came out, people used to always respond to emails, right? Now I think a lot of, I, one, of the, one of the things I think a lot of salespeople, mistakes salespeople might make is that they don't call call enough. Every time I've reached out to someone via email, you know, it takes a while and you have to hunt them down. Sometimes I'm hunting for a contact that maybe knows that person. But if you cold call someone and you get them on the phone, I mean, you're connected, you have them. 
right? So I, you just have to embrace it. And I, you know, honestly, the more you do it, the easier it is. Like sometimes I'll just take a, like a whole day and all I'll do is cold call. And when you're doing that, it makes it easier to um, get in a rhythm, to be honest. You know, like there are even times where like, if I kind of like take a break and I'm doing more email or more presentations or RFPs, um, you know, I'm not as good, right? So, I mean, this is the part of the cold calling. So, I mean, it really is the number one prospecting method. Um, and it gives you a chance to talk directly to that person. But you don't want to blow it, right? When you get that person on the phone. So the most important thing is to have some sort of script, right? Like you don't want to just call and not know what you're going to say. So I think this is why some people get a little bit nervous. Um, but again, like once you get into it and you're doing it frequently, the better you become, especially if you're selling like just one product, right? So like when I was using that cop, you know, for example, like, you know, something like that, they might have you calling, you know, for five different clients, right? So that's, you know, that hourly wage too is a lot, is a lot more work for that. But if you're just calling for your client <clears throat> or for your company or a company that you're doing, you know, working for, you know, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to create a script that highlights the benefit of your product and includes answers to possible customer objections, what I found the best way to do this is to, to practice with someone. No one is good at uh, role-playing um, cold calls, like, cause it's awkward, but you want your mind thinking about what objection the person is gonna do, you know? So really before you dial, practice, 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 you know, grab a roommate, grab whoever, family member, but get someone to practice with you where you get it down because you want to get your script down, but you want, also want to get the objections down. So this is where, you know, the secret to cold calling is really the role playing. Um, and you want to really make it as realistic as possible. Most people are going to push back. It's just, it's just human nature, right? I mean, and you want to optimize your, your outreach list um, and you want to understand the different products that they have. So when you're cold calling, what you don't want to do is jump right into, um, you don't want to just like start pushing your product, right? You want to make it a two-way dialogue. You have this person on the phone, so important, right? So you want to know what some of their, their problems are, you know? So you want to ask, uh, you know, you want to ask, you know, is this something you're looking at? You know, if you happen to know who your um, competitors are, are you working with someone else, um, right? So don't be afraid. I mean, usually when you get someone on the phone, the first thing you you know, you'll know you say is, this is, you know, Heather Wetzler from Q Career. Um, I'm sorry to, you know, grab you at a bad time. Uh, it's now a good time. And, you know, if someone, I mean, most likely they're gonna try to get you off the phone as quick as possible. Like, let's be realistic, <laughs> right? But they might be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm jumping into a meeting. Oh, well, right before you just jump in, you know, you could do one of two things. Can we schedule, you know, if you feel like they're gonna really try to hang up on you, can we, can I, can we schedule a time that's better? You know, and then the person is gonna probably say, well, what is this about? Um, and they're going to say, well, I'm calling from such and such, and I want to, you know, talk to you about X, Y, Z. So the other thing to do is to research your prospects, right? So for research, you're going to usually look at LinkedIn, um, you know, and then if, it, you know, per, you know, you'll look to see on their LinkedIn profile, things that they've liked, things that they've posted, you know, even Google searching their name. But you want to, you don't want to just assume, you know, that this person needs your product, right? So again, you want it to be a dialogue. So by researching your prospects, you know, you could even say, oh, I saw that you liked, you know, this conference that's coming up. Are you going to that? Like, we're going to be exhibiting there, right? So there's different ways. Like, you want to, when you have that person on the phone, not turn them off. Um, you want to connect with them. And again, make a lot of calls. Practice makes perfect. Do you guys have any questions up till now? One of the questions that I have is, especially if you're just starting up, how do you start really building those um, like contact numbers? Because as a millennial, 
I don't think I ever really call anyone. <laughs> um, and if anybody FaceTimes me, I'm just like immediately, no, you can send me a text. Um, so mm -hmm. how do you really do communicate uh, when it comes to cold call? Is it is cold calling just applied to an actual physical phone call or can it be applied also like as an email or, you know, a message, a direct message on LinkedIn and stuff like that? Because I think to me, that's a little less intimidating than if I'm mm -hmm. actually making an actual phone call. Sure. Um, but what, what would you suggest, you know, one building it cold, or two? Cold call is really a cold call, right? <laughs> and again, it's, it's gonna, it is, I promise you will yield the most results. So what I will normally do is I will, and again, like most people, like sometimes you're calling someone's cell, depending on where you got their number. And sometimes you're calling um, maybe their work voicemail, right? So there's a couple of things I do. I usually will cold call and then I will leave a message, right? So I have two scripts, right? One script for if I'm leaving a message, you know, and you don't want to ramble on and on, but you want to, the good thing about having a script is like, you don't want to avoid a lot of the uhs, ums, pauses. So, you know, okay. you can just get through the script super quick. And then I usually say, I'm going to follow up with an email, right? Oh, okay. So then I'll follow up with an email. Um, and, you know, and you kind of like, so again, this is where it's a numbers game and it's kind of, it's called layering. Right. So it's like I make one phone call, follow up with an email. You know, four days later, I follow up with another phone call. I send another email. You know, I wait another four days. Now, depending on if I have that person's cell phone number, I may, um, depending on a lot of things, because sometimes their age, right? So if you're looking up them on LinkedIn, so I, you know, for one job, I had a call on um, companies that were startups that I could tell like their staff was fairly young, right? So in that case, I texted this one guy and just said, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Want to, you know, want to see if we could, you know, grab a meeting. And he texted back and said, sure, 10 a.m., you know, on Friday, right? So then I, you know, texted back. I said, great, I'm going to send you a calendar invite, right? So I know a lot of people aren't, especially probably your generation, aren't used to cold calling, but again, it is the most effective, right? So I would say if you want to be a good salesperson, um, you need to get comfortable with it. And again, a lot, of, a lot of people don't even answer their phone, right? But that persistence and the fact that like you're going to keep calling, you know, the person will usually deal with you um, in some way. Um, and the other thing too, so like this is where like the CRM, right? So you're optimizing your outreach. So you're creating an outreach list with personas. And what I think that uh, Antonia, the first question you asked me was like, maybe where I get the numbers from. So like that, you know, depends. So um, most companies in their CRM tool already have clients or people or personas prospects um, phone numbers and most of them will be their landlines and their cell numbers. I normally, I never start with someone's cell phone number. Um, I always start with the landline. Um, that's just me. If someone wants, if you want to start with the cell phone number, go for it. Um, and then there's something called Zoom Info, not to be confused with the Zoom that we're on now, but Zoom Info is also a service that salespeople pay for that gives them um, people's uh, not just email address, but phone numbers usually sell. And so there's different sales tools too that you can subscribe to. Um, I think you would also now, to be honest, uh, chat, I was looking someone up the other day for, on chat uh, GBT, the AI, the new AI chat tool. And uh, it gave me someone's phone number there the other day. So, which I think they pulled from Zoom info, right? So they might've given it to me Okay, I thought it was just me, but it looks like she's having some That's internet great. issues. <laughs> she'll be back. She'll be back. I actually don't like have to, to move back. now. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll give her a chance to come back in here in just a sec. She's saying some really yeah. like important things too. There you go, Heaven. Can you guys hear me or see me? Yes, yes. Now, there, yep, I think there's just a little now. bit of a buffer. Okay. Yep. You're back now. 
All right. We were just saying, saying some really important things around, I mean, you know, there's probably something to be said about, you know, what, what, what the fears are around sales too. I think your presentation mm -hmm. is when it's like, you know, I'm hearing you say, um, you know, we've got to get really good at cold calling, talking to folks online, you know, uh, through the phone that we don't know. And I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like, you know, for a lot of people, that's like the scariest thing to do <laughs> is that rejection. And, and, and how, how do you prep someone to face that rejection? Right. So for every, you know, if you're calling 40, 50, 60, or, or reaching out or contacting, you're going to get some non-responses. You're going to get some no's. You're going to get some, uh, you know, not right now, uh, et cetera. Like, how do you, how do you prep? But you, you have thick skin. So, cause you're like, let's, let's go, let's keep going. But How do you I mean, do the fun entrepreneur? Have, yeah. Uh, thick skin. I started off in my, I went to school for journalism and I started off as kind of like an artist, like a writer, right? So people don't believe this about me, but I was actually more introverted than I was extroverted. Um, the career that I chose was I was living in New York City and wasn't exactly paying the bills. So I was kind of forced into sales more of a, as a survival um and then for me i kind of i gamified it right it became like this game so for me what i do is i try not to get personally attached to if someone's not nice to me you know and people do that in different ways to be honest like i have one sales guy who he was cold calling and a client hung up on him and kind of said D i'm not you know don't ever call me again um, and the guy, and he called him back the next day. And the guy's like, didn't I? He's like, you know what? I thought you were kidding. I thought you were just having a bad day, you know? So what are you going to say to that, right? And again, like, as, if you're doing your homework, I mean, one thing that I don't like about LinkedIn messages, um, and personally, like, I mean, as a salesperson, I try to respond, but that's just me because I'm in sales, right? So most people don't respond, but I get so many, and and now I'm a little bit more picky with my responses because I get so many inbound leans on LinkedIn that are so irrelevant to me. I'm like, obviously they didn't research me. They have no idea what I do or what my company does. And they're pitching me something that's like, I would never use, right? So if I encounter lazy salespeople, then yeah, I'm probably not super, you know, warm and fuzzy, <laughs> you know, but if you've done your research, and if you look at it like I'm trying to solve this person's problem, right? And even if you're a new company and a startup, um, you know, that's where, you know, I think that's where you kind of start to have your, you know, the thick skin that comes in handy. Also, you know, some of the people that you might be calling, if you, you know, look them up on LinkedIn and maybe they're connected to a friend of yours, you know, and maybe you call that friend before and be like, hey, do you know so-and-so? Could you make the introduction, right? But I think like, you know, the first one or two, even for me, even like, even though I've been doing this for 16 years, my first one or two um, cold calls, I get nervous even, you know, because it's like, I'm not maybe 100% comfortable with the script. But if it's something you're doing consistently, you do get comfortable with it. You know, it's probably like the way an actor or actress feels, you know, once they have their script down, right? It's no different than for a salesperson. Um, but back to your point, Kenny, like here are some common, you know, cold calling objections. I'm not interested. I can't afford it. You know, I'm not involved in that. That's not my responsibility. We're already using a similar product. You know, someone will say, you know, is this a uh, telemarketing call? Um, you know, the not interested can come from different places. You know, the first occurs before the buyer even knows what you're selling. And it's a reflexive brush off. Their goal is to preserve their time and get you off the phone. When you hear it at the front of a call, you know, try to ask the question to the value of your product um, and that you can provide to, you know, to pique their interest or their curiosity. So, for example, if I was a tow truck company and, um, and then I was calling, you know, a tow truck company owner, you know, I would say, oh, you're not interested in the product that could make your tow truck company operators safer, right? I mean, if that's what obviously the product does. <laughs> but, you know, so you're trying to do this, like, you know, so that they're just trying to brush you off. I mean, doing so requires them to engage and start a dialogue. And that's really what you're trying to do. You know, it also introduces your product in a way that's relevant to them. 
Um, if, and they could still say no and hang up, but it's typically a sign that you called it a bad time, you know, and maybe you should try them again later, you know, and you might not remember every called call you make, but, you know, 90% of the time the buyer won't. So, I mean, don't sweat calling people back a week or a month later. Um, so on the other hand, if someone listens to your sales, you know, your elevator pitch and still says, I'm not interested, you know, then you kind of have a problem, uh, especially if that's happening frequently, you know, so you want to really find out why um, that's going on. You know, and if someone says, is this a telemarketing call, um, which again, think about all, like the perforation of spam and telemarketing calls, you know, we're so weary of picking up our phone for an unknown number. Um, you know, you're obviously, when someone says, is this a telemarketing call, you're obviously never going to say yes. <laughs> um, but, right. you know, I would suggest, you know, challenging it, coming at it head on. And just say, I'm confused. Why do you assume I'm a telemarketer? You know, again, getting them to engage, you know, just be like, oh, I hate telemarketing calls too, but no, I have a product that I actually think, you know, would be useful for you, right? So it's like, you're getting back in control, uh, you know, and you're you're commiserating with them too. Oh, I hate telemarketers as well. <laughs> um, and does anyone else have any questions? I think we haven't gotten anything, but for those who are listening, at the bottom of your screen, there is the question and answer um, button. And so if you want to ask or the chat, but so far we haven't gotten anything. So please continue. Okay. And so we're going to. Yeah. Go ahead, Kenny. I was going to say if you wanted to uh, use the share screen, uh, feature again, you, you're more than welcome to do so. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing my screen. Uh, it came down when the when the tech kind of went fuzzy on us. Got it. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was saying. So I was kind of going over the role playing. Here are the key of. So this is the slide that I was talking over when I thought you guys could see my screen. So again, these are the, co the five most common objections um, that you want to have answers to when you're cold calling. And again, this is just going to make you feel more comfortable when you're doing it. Um, back to the I'm not interested. You know, you really want to know if they're not interested because the product is not a fit or they cannot not afford it or are they using a competitor. Um, and this goes back to the CRM when I was talking about how to spot in Salesforce. This is where you want to keep track of that. Um, and you want to, you know, so if they say you can't afford it, you know, they mean they can't afford it right now, right? So you might want to ask them like some questions about their fiscal year budget, but you want to, in the CRM, what you would do is you'd go and make a calendar note you know, to call them back and, you know, whatever time after talking to them seems appropriate. It could be six months, it could be a year, right? But the, I can't afford it usually means they can't afford it right then. Um, so back to the CRM stuff, it's really important to keep good detailed notes and the soft skill around this would be active listening. So again, you want to get them talking. If it is that they're using a competitor, right? never bash a, you know, a competitor. I mean, that should go without saying, but even if the competitor is awful <laughs> and you know that they're doing shady things, that is not a conversation you wanna have. So, but what you, you know, wanna find out is, um, and, and hopefully you know this, right? You know, are you more expensive than your competitor? Are you less expensive, right? So if they're like, oh, we're using so-and-so. Oh, well, that's great. You know, they're, uh, you know, we love those. We, we, we know the guys over there. Um, we're a little cheaper, you know, and we provide X, Y, and Z, right? If you're more expensive, you wouldn't leave a price. You'd probably say like, oh, we have these bells and whistles, you know, can I maybe do a demo for you? You never know, you know, at some point if you want to switch, right? So again, doing the, getting them on the phone, this is where, you know, the cold calling probably is when I said it's so, is so important. It's because you're 
it's the easiest way to gather information. It's just, it's more proactive, right? In an email, people usually aren't going to put anything in writing. You know, they're not going to say how much they're paying, you know, if it, they're paying your competitor, but they might over the phone. You know, I've had a lot of clients reveal stuff to me over the phone that they would obviously never put in writing, or they would say, well, just between us, right? So again, I know a lot of people don't like cold calling, but if you're going to be a salesperson or a very effective salesperson, um, getting comfortable with it, however you do it, um, it's, you know, one of the most effective ways and skills to have. So again, going into the kind of like the early sales process stages, um, you're doing the cold calling, you're doing emails, you're doing events, you're pre-qualifying. Um, and one thing that you're you do too, um, and I'll send this deck to Kenny, um, and I'll have kind of some some um, worksheets that you could fill in. And again, this could be used for when you're if you're looking for a job as well, right? The more information you have on a company you're interviewing with, or a person you're interviewing with, again, instead of being a product that you're selling for a job interview, you're selling yourself. So. For sales, what we do, we call it the, the persona, which is who is your ideal customer profile? So, you know, if you're walking into a large corporation, it's been around for a while, they know this information. But if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting up, this is kind of when things that you start to even collect before you have a product sometimes, like when you're doing your beta. So, you know, if you are calling on Rachel, who is a small business owner, you know, and say you wanted to sell her like a social media, um, a social media software, a SaaS software so for social media, you know, you'd kind of do this persona on her, seeing how often she posts on social media. Is she the key decision maker as the small business owner? Does she have someone else doing it? Um, her demographics, you know, um, and her goals, right, and challenges. So, if you have her on the phone during a cold call, you could, you know, have some of these things that you're sketching out or you're typing into the CRM for a sales force, right? So if you're looking to sell a social media product, you know, you might ask her how she does her posts, right? So one of her things as a small business owner might be to save time online. Oh, well, we can help with that. For X amount of month, we could automate your posts you know, and find interesting content sh to share and maximize your social media resources, right? So you're kind of breaking this out into understanding the value metric based on data. You know, so this is kind of like what one of the worksheets, you know, could look like, you know, real quotes about the challenges and, girl and, and goals from the person you're speaking to on the cold call. <laughs> you know, what can we do to help marketing messaging, you know, elevator pitch and common objections, you know, and all of this, like this kind of helps like when you're getting started as an entrepreneur, but eventually all this information lives in your CRM. So one thing that I always did uh, from a customer standpoint is as I was um, prospecting and getting to know my clients in the CRM, um, and as I got to know my clients, I would write down like their wife or husband's name. Because most of the time, like, right, if you're selling like a yearly contract, right? So you're, let's say you're only talking to a person like once a year, which happens, um, you're probably not going to remember if they brought up like their wife or their child's name, right? But as a salesperson, <laughs> you know, you, you should know that. It, again, if they've mentioned it to you. So again, the CRM husband's name, wife's name, <laughs> children's names, you know, oh, they like skiing, you know, so the other thing I would do too, for things that when I've talked to them, if you know, about their interests, so I happen to be a skier. So one thing, if I found out someone else liked to be skiing, as I saw articles about either snow conditions that year or something that interests me, I would, I would send that to them via email, right? And that for me was like another point of, of like touch contact with them. So um, maybe they bought from me and their contract was coming up or maybe they didn't and I was going to want to reach out again. But again, it's like you're kind of touching them without always doing a sale, right? And you know something that they happen to like. Um, 
so that type of, you know, consultative and customer sales, you know, if you're going to be around for a long time comes in handy. Also, you know, for the industry I was in for sales, I was in internet advertising um, sales. So you're kind of, so a lot of times you're jumping, you know, I mean, now I think a lot of people jump from job to job, but like for me, I was jumping from job to job because I worked for a lot of startups and not all of them made it, right? So, but a lot of the people I, I knew from one job would be my clients at the next job, right? So, I mean, that helped too, because I would be, when I was pitching myself for the job interview, I was like, oh, what do you bring to the table other than your sales skills? Oh, I also have, you know, this list of clients, right? Like these people know me, they like me, not only have I've sold to them, but like they like me as a person, right? And the way they, and the way people get to like you as a person is they get to know you. Um, so again, as you're doing sales, that comes in handy. So this was, um, a girl. So on social media, there's this, uh, vegan food truck and, you know, I thought it was interesting for how she was kind of gathering some of her information. She would kind of do a schedule for a week and saying where she was, you know, and again, like book your next event, X, Y, and Z. And then for this one, um, she won, I guess, a billboard, um, and then she did. So uh, she's there's a new black-owned vegan food truck in town. You know, congrats, Chanel. And like she had the, you know, and she picked the billboard and like had her her truck underneath it, right? So again, like that was a really good way for her to kind of like promote some of the stuff um, that she was doing too. So sales and marketing do go hand in hand. Um, you know, there's this one, this donut shop, actually, they, they, they got sold, but like on their Instagram, they would do all these like crazy different, like donut takeovers and different types of donuts. Um, you know, but there's different ways that you could use social media to start to engage in your audience as well, too. Again, depending on the product, I mean, food and donuts, you know, it's a lot easier than if you're selling a B2B <laughs> software. Um, so you're going to do what makes and uh, for you. Um, okay, so now to networking. I know you guys had a, a session on networking. Um, yeah. So, you know, for me, there have been times where I'm trying to get in touch with someone who's very high up um, in an organization. Right. And like one person who I still have not been able to reach <laughs> is there's this guy, Johnny Taylor, who works at an association called SHRM. And every time I've even seen him at an event, he walks around and there's like five, I don't want to say bodyguards, but he has like an entourage. And I know a ton of people that know him and they're like, he doesn't even call me back. Right. So, but still, I have Johnny on my, my radar at some point. I want to talk to him, you know, but at the end of the day, um, he's not the most important person for me to talk to. There are other people in, in the SHRM organization uh, for me to speak with. And I was at a conference last week in San Diego. And this is the other thing about entrepreneurship too. Like you, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for, you know, ways to get out there with no budget, right? Like when we first started our company, like we had no money but there would be conferences that we wanted to go to. So this conference I went to last week is in San Diego. And even though they do like an entrepreneur or startup budget, it's still, I think the startup budget is still like two grand, right? So, I mean, that's still not, I mean, it's like, thanks. That doesn't really help. But I know that everyone I want to talk to is going to be in San Diego. And it's not at a convention center. It's actually at a hotel. So I've done this for the last four years. I literally drive down to San Diego and I sit in the lobby and I'm able to figure out all the people who are going. And I mean, I basically act like I'm there. I'm just not going to his sessions, which I don't need to anyway. Like I know what they're gonna say. You know, for me, it's really about networking. And just from last week, I came away with like four and then there are parties after. And again, just to be, just to be clear, just like the cold calling, at this age, I really have no interest in going out at night or going to parties, like zero. <laughs> um, but 
when I know that all the people that I want to talk to are going to these parties, you're going to muscle it and work through it. So we literally, like, I took meetings all day Monday and all day Tuesday and then drove back actually Tuesday night um, from San Diego. So, and I got up at, we got up at five in the morning and drove down. So we just got a hotel for one night, you know, and that hotel for one night paid off. And I actually met with like all these guys from Sherm. <laughs> they walked into a party and I was like, hi, you know, um, and then followed up. The guy was actually really nice. He followed up with me this week. Uh, and he's like, here's my calendar delete. Sorry, it was loud. Um, but networking, right? And again, this is where, you know, it's not a popularity contest, but in sales, you never want to burn bridges and, you know, and use your network. I mean, really a lot of times, if people like you or your product, like they'll help make an introduction. Like there's this woman, her name is Jane Oates. Like she's amazing. And she's kind of a mentor, but I actually met her at the conference I was at last week about four years ago. <laughs> and since then we've become close. And anytime I call, like if I see she's connected to someone, like I will send her an email and be like, Jane, can you introduce me to so-and-so? And like, she'll do it by that day. You know, she's probably a little bit unusual, but, um, but uh, you know, trying to get strong referrals and as you sell your products, building case studies and getting referrals from your, from your clients about what they like is really helpful. You know, it's just a very powerful way to build relationships for sales. So I actually, I'm in California now, but I actually grew up in Connecticut, in Fairfield County. And there is a grocery store there called Stu Leonard's. And outside they had this sign like a, on a rock and it said our policies. Rule number one, the customer is always right. Rule number two, if the customer is ever wrong, read rule number one. And, <laughs> and um, again, yeah, like this is so true in sales. You know, if a client calls you and they're not happy, right? You're going to try to do everything in your power and, it, you know, to get them to where they need to be, right? Don't ever like poo poo them. I mean, I worked when I was working in sales for the company called Deviant Art. It was a large artist website that was all user generated content. We were doing a billion page views a month. It was insane. It was an insane site. So I was the vice president of sales and I would walk into the movie studios and leverage that. And I'd run these contests. I would sell them like, hey, you know, Scott Pilgrim movies coming out. Like, what if we did a contest like create your eighth evil X? And our, you know, we'd post this the studios would pay us a ton of money and our artists would create artwork around it. Um, there was one time where a movie studio came on with us and they were about to be sued for copyright, which if you know artists, it's a really serious thing. You know, like when we were doing these contracts, you know, these contests even like we had, we always protected our artists. Like that was our community. That's how we were making money. And this movie studio came on, did not tell, did not share that with me. And we posted this contest and the artists knew about it, right? From wherever they were reading, I don't want to say 4chan, but wherever, like somewhere they knew about it. And um, also we were just getting all these negative comments on the site. And my salesperson comes into my office and she's like, um, we have like 2000 comments already. And we just posted, I'm like, are they bad? And she's like, oh yeah, they're bad. <laughs> So I was like, what's the problem? And she's like, there seems like there's a, you know, art theft. I'm like, all right. So it's like, we had to get on, on a call with the client and the client, um, the client was okay, but their agency who we went through, um, you know, I was trying to calm them down. Cause they're like, take it down. I was like, look, like actually contest our legal entity. I can't just rip it down. Um, we can get to the process of taking it down, but like we have to have this conversation and, you know, and I apologized. I said, I'm sorry that I can't take it down right now, you know? And she's like, you're just not sorry enough. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but again, she was, you know, again, like when legal stuff comes up like that and it's very, you know, things go viral and things that we don't want, you know, go viral. They were very, 
so as a salesperson, I just had to do everything in my power. You know, in that case, basically <laughs> my lawyer, not mine, but the company lawyer was writing a script for me of what I could and could not say, right? And I was pushing back on that a little bit too, because I was like, I don't know what this is. He's like, Heather, he's like, the whole goal here is that no one gets sued. I'm like, okay. Um, but again, going back to the customer, I mean, the customer was not super nice to me that day, um, but still like that they're right, you know, they're upset and you just have to do. And again, this is where too, like that networking and those connections do come back because even though that day and, you know, even though like, that was a bad experience. Like we got it handled. We got it dealt with, you know, we got it sorted. Everyone was as happy as they were going to be. Right. I was like, why wouldn't you tell me that? You were? I was like, I never, if you said there was an issue around this movie, I never would have posted it to the site, you know, but again, like two months later, they had another movie coming out and onward and upward. Right. And the onward and upward was because we dealt with it um, in a proper way. Right. Without losing your cool um us right not them they were they were the client they're allowed to be mad um but we dealt with it and they're happy with the end product um back to the other funnel that i was mentioning so you know again points of contact it really takes 60 i would even say probably now like 100 cold calls to get to four meaningful conversations um and again, when you're calling, if you if out of a if out of 60 calls you get four people on the phone, that's great. Like that's a good day, even if they're not super happy to talk to you right then and there. But a lot of people just don't answer the phone right now. Um, but doesn't mean you want to give up. And some people do. Yeah, Kenny. Heather, how would you how would you define meaningful? Like what would be a, a meaningful call? Because I can I can see um, you know, maybe an entrepreneur or someone. Uh, making attempts on sales, having an engagement, and in their mind, it was meaningful. But what what might be a checklist of like um, of things to think about when we call something like a meaningful engagement? Is it is it a next step that should occur, or some call to action that the potential customer is taking, et cetera? Like how how does someone measure if it was meaningful? Sure. Yeah, I would say that, you know, for every call that you are, you know, for every person that you're calling, you know, you have a checklist of outcomes that you want. It could be scheduling, you know, the next call for a demo. You know, it could be um, that you found out they don't have money at this time. So even though they're not going to be a client anytime soon, you know, knowing that they don't have budget is good because then you're not going to waste your time with them for another six months, right? So in that sense, it's meaningful. Um, it could, that you found out that they're using one of your competitors. Um, it could be that they have no idea what you're selling to them, like in that space. Um, and then again, trying to convince them to do a demo. So I would have a list of what they think is, you know, meaningful. I mean, for us as a startup, you know, a lot of times for one of our products, a lot of people don't like to be first, even if you're giving something away, right? So like one of our products that we were building, we were trying to get people to, you know, come on um, to test it out. And they're like, well, you know, and then we finally found someone to come on. And then, you know, then the rest of the people, and then I would say, oh, and we're, we're doing a pilot with so-and-so. And then the rest of the people are like, oh, well, when that's done, follow up with me. I want to see the case study, right? So. And then you're going to have like a case study lined out where, I mean, again, like you're never going to have a bad case study as long as there's a product market fit for your product as an entrepreneur, right? So you're going to have like a case study outline, you know, and as you're, as you're doing a pilot with someone, especially if you're doing it for free, right? You're going to say to them, like, I want to get a reference or a quote from you when we're done, right? So you're going to, you're going to want to make sure you're going to lead that conversation to hit all the, all the major points. And then back to the CRM tool, you know, you're going to have calendar um, and notes of like who to call back that are like, hey, call me when that when that's done. Um, I want some more information, you know. And again, I would try to get them on the phone again, you know, instead of just sending the case study. Okay, just sending something is very, um, you know, it's not proactive, right? It would more be like, hey, can we set up a call? We just finished our, our pilot and I want to walk you through the case study. 
right? Because you want them to ask questions. Because if you're just sending them something and they look at, at the case study and they have objections, you know, they they may email you back and ask questions or they might just be like, eh, it's not for me to delete, right? So again, if you can get that person on the phone and get them talking, you can deal with those objections, you know, in real time, which is more valuable. Um, you know, and again, out of those four meeting conversations, maybe you'll get to present three times in a demo, maybe you'll do two proposals, you know, and you'll close one sale. But as an entrepreneur, it really is a numbers game um, of getting people, you know, into that sales funnel. Um, helpful sales tools. Um, I think I went over CRM a lot. So hopefully, you know, again, HubSpot or Salesforce. And again, if you don't have a way, if you don't have money for HubSpot right now, which I understand because in the very beginning we didn't either, you know, Google Docs is great. You know, an Excel spreadsheet, you're keeping notes. However, you could pull the information out there and make calendar, calendar notes on it. Um, prospecting tools. So LinkedIn is a great prospecting tool, right? You know, you're looking for people that work in a certain industry. You can Google that industry, you know, Google a company and find different, you know, different titles for the people that work there. There's also a plugin to Chrome called Clearbit. And Clearbit Connect is free, I think up for, I think it gives you 200 contacts a month. So I use that if I can't find someone's um, email, right? Sometimes I guess at their email, and I send it, it bounces. But Clearbit is a good, is a good one to use if you need someone's email address. And then maybe you even get, find other people's emails and you can see the format of the email, right? And then, and then figure it out that, that way. Um, Calendly is, is great too. Um, most people that I set meetings with, like instead of going back and forth over email like five times, trying to pick a date, like, here's my calendar, schedule something. Um, I always save those too. <laughs> so um, I have a list as well <laughs> of, um, you know, because some people have that in their email, in their signature. Um, but I always save the calendar li links in case I want to talk to someone again. <laughs> you know, so instead of like reaching back out to them <laughs> over the phone or in an email, I will just pop up on their calendar. Um, again, effective. You know, I've never had someone be like, you know, they just assume that at some point, well, they did give it to me, right? But even if it's like a year or two down the road, you know, I've never been, they've never been like, how did you get this? Or, you know, because again, like it's, it's ones that I've, that they've given to me. Um, and sometimes I found some people put their calendar sometimes on LinkedIn and I've used that too. Um, again, it was another effective way for me to get <laughs> meetings. Um, again, when you're for social media or when you're prospecting and looking people up, you know, if you could find their Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and, you know, you get to see, I mean, one thing to be cognizant of for your social media, right? When you're building your company or, or calling, um, I keep most of my stuff private, you know, you might, you might not want people to see um, political posts or what have you. Um, but you can find everything on, on LinkedIn. But if you find other people there and, you know, and, and look stuff up, like I find it useful to look other people up. I just try to have mine, you know, behind a, a walled garden. Um, you know, Nextdoor and Yelp, I think is helpful for the small businesses that are more like the mechanics or auto detailing. Um, and for email marketing, you know, there's Constant Contact or MailChimp, which tend to be expensive. And now there's ones that are, are way less expensive. Um, so HubSpot lets you also do emails that way. Um, but there's something called Campaign Monitor. Um, and I think you get a thousand, I think you get like a thousand, you could send out like a thousand emails like in a HTML newsletter um, for $9.99 a month, you know? So again, if you don't have a lot of email addresses or you want to, you have something that you want to market, um, you know, if you're going to be at a conference or if you have a booth or, you know, something like that, it might be worth it. Um, yeah, so to kind of recap, we are all salespeople. 
um, you know, you're going to use some of your soft skills to become a better salesperson. And again, like hard skills versus soft skills, soft skills are communication, teamwork, time management, you know, and the hard skills are knowing, um, you know, CRM, um, and such. And, you know, the number one soft skill for sales is really active listening. So you don't want to just really listen when people are talking. And if you can get someone to talk, let them just talk. <laughs> you don't have to keep inter keep interjecting. Um, you know, it's really, oh, and you know, at the end of it too, it's good to summarize or clarify. So if someone, if you are talking about the product, you know, and if they said something that maybe, you know, instead of guessing, you know, you're just like, summarizing or saying, let me just see if I got this right. And repeating back to them, you know, what they said is really helpful too. But really listening is the key for sales, but you want to get someone talking <laughs> before you're able to do that. So that's really it. I was going to This was amazing. Was I literally took like so many notes and I was just like, I, I got to do it. <laughs> um, that's part of my active listening is I have to like take notes so that I can repeat what others say, but mm -hmm. this was definitely absolutely great. Thank you so much, Heather. This, this is wonderful. Um, and I think that, that, that is, we really truly are. And I see that so much in like TikTok now with like the influencers and YouTube was just like, if TikTok tells me I need it, then I'm like, okay, well now I have to buy it. <laughs> hey, you know, you know, you, when you were talking about the script earlier, Mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, I went into, I slipped over to chat GPT and I put a little like, you know, I asked chat GPT to give me just a short, like sales pitch script for, you know, X product, et cetera. And so for those who are with us, we went over chat GPT, mm -hmm. how to use it. You know, Brad did a great job on our workshop one and two, and it's, it's a recurring thing because I think in every yeah. workshop so far, AI has popped up and how AI is impacting all of this as well. Um, from, your, from your standpoint, Heather, um, you know, how has AI impacted the sales process or technology advance, technological advancement uh, impacted the sales process from your, from your point of view? Because you know, as, you're, as you've been in sales all these years um, and you've seen things change and updating and you know, now it's just moving at a rapid rate. You've used ChatGPT, you mentioned the other day. It's so, you know, to prompt it for things, it just seems like um, some of these things that uh, require like a human element, um, AI and technology is creating a space that allows for, um, you know, for it to be automated more. But what's your what's your perspective on on some of that? Yeah, I mean, from a salesperson, I think it's a dream come true. I mean, I've definitely have started using chat GBT for prospecting, you know, as I'm researching instead of going to like, you know, so many different sites, you know, I could type in a person's name, the company they're at, and it'll give me sometimes their email, their phone number, you know, some of their social media links, and sometimes like something about them, or if they have a blog and they wrote something, you know, and then I could look that over and then just put that all in CRM. So for me, it's a time saver, which salespeople love, right? Because like researching again, it's like, you know, I'll have one day where it's like, I'm purely researching the people I'm going to call. And then the next day, it's just cold calling. You know, and you always have to practice for cold calling because, again, like if I even if I get out of the habit and I've been doing it for so many years, like I could easily blow a call, right, or blow a script because I just haven't practiced it enough. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, I've seen people I've seen people that have used chat GBT for even like cover letters, um, helping them with that, you know, like you said, like scripts, um, information like, you know, part of your research is is knowing information about your competitors, right? So sometimes I'll type into there, like what is so-and-so charge or, you know, um, testimonials for so-and-so. So, I mean, it really is a, a super helpful tool for our sales people to use. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, well, um, any other questions from uh, members in the chat? Feel free to do so now. Um, but this, this subject of, of sales is always, it's just ongoing and, and really difficult, um, for some people to figure out, but I, I realized that 
possibly, you know, one of the, the key things is what you've been talking about is relationship building, like mm -hmm. tracking relationship building, you know, and offering a space to build a relationship, you know, with someone, an organization or an individual um, to continue to share how your product or service is helping to solve their need or fulfill their want um, is can require a mindset shift, you know, for because uh, that's just not, not normally how we think about going into conversations. Oftentimes we go into conversations of what we get out of the conversation or what we get out of the relationship. And I'm finding that to be successful in sales, you've got to lean in with, you know, um, what's what's really important for the other person. So it's very other centered strategy, uh, you know, when building when building these relationships. So I love these tools. They've been really helpful. We, this, this uh, for those that are uh, listening to the recording, this will be uh, recorded. This is recorded. So, uh, you know, between Nicolette College and IFTE, we'll be able to share this out with our, our um, larger audience of alumni and students and faculty that may want to use this for uh, strategies in their classrooms or, um, you know, entrepreneurs that, that we share this with as well. So, uh, Heather, I, I give you the mic to kind of give us one last, any last, leave, you know, thoughts for us as we think about this topic in a much more deeper way and, um, you know, upskill a little bit stronger in terms of utilizing the tools um, to be a better sales salesperson. Yeah, I mean, I really think, you know, doing something like, you know, Salesforce Trailhead, um, you know, for, for the CRM is important, right? So, you know, getting to be more, extroverted, you know, I would say for sales, it's really practice. I mean, when I, when, again, like when we started this startup, there were so many events in LA and we were probably out every night and it's not like I enjoy being out, you know, at night. And again, it's always awkward. I think the key for people to know is that I'm not saying cold calling isn't awkward, right? And even for me, and I've been doing it for 16 years, like, it's still awkward, but like when you're making so many in a row, you do start to get comfortable with it. It's like anything, you know, um, and maybe look at it like it's a little bit of a performance. Like, you know, I, I was teaching a sales um, upskilling um, program. And one things I would do is like, I would pull from what stand up comics do, right. It's like an improv talking um, and having people kind of, you'd have to basically create a script with the last three words that the person said, right? So what I was trying to do is like two things, get them to actively listen, right? So you have to listen to make sure you hear what the person said and remember their last three words, you know? And then you had to, you know, quick, you know, think quickly on your feet and say something else. But like, even like, you know, so, I mean, networking cold calling are not, are not the easiest things. I think even for like the most extroverted people, like, especially when we don't know people, like when, at term labs at this party, you know, and I was invited to the party and I wanted to meet this guy, you know, but I didn't know him. And I went up and I was like, I'm Heather. And it was so awkward. Like he was totally, he was like, okay. You know, and he, like, he, he walked away from me, <laughs> but I realized like I overwhelmed him, you know, and then I made my way back over to him and I was kind of like standing and I was like, I didn't drive all the way down to San Diego, like not to talk. Like, this is the one guy I talked to a lot of people, but like, I didn't come this far, like not to talk to him. Right. So finally, like he turned back around. I was like, I'm sorry. I, I, and he's like, no, he's like, Heather, he's like, I, he's like, I've been talking all day. He's like, and we have this new um, like Sherm Labs. And like, he was like, I was up at like 11 o'clock at night with like our whatever, Europe or Japan or whatever, you know? So the guy didn't sleep, right? I mean, he was just like, <laughs> so I was like, look, I was like, I just wanted to put a, a face to a name and we'll follow up next week. You know, and we ended up talking about it for 15 minutes, right? And it was nice. And before I even got a chance to email him, he emailed me today. I was like, hey, let's follow up. And here's my calendar link. You know, so again, like, was I awkward? Yeah, I mean, I basically like attacked the guy when he walked in the door, you know, um, <laughs> but I also wanted to get on the road and get back up, uh, <laughs> driving back to LA. So again, like, you know, as long as you come across as sincere and you, again, back to, you know, what we mentioned earlier, like 
I know he needs to know who we are, right? Because like, I'm also working with other associations for like one of the products. So, you know, even though I'm trying to sell him something, it's also beneficial for him to know. And we know a lot of the same people, right? So you also have to look at it like, hey, like I, you just need to, you know, I was being e egotistical, right? But I was like, I just want to let you know like what we're doing. And, and here's why I think you would be interested, you know, and then get that dialogue started. But again, cold calling and networking is not easy. But if you're going to be successful in anything in life, and that's finding a job, most people get jobs from who they know. Yes. Right. So you have to be out there, right? And you're selling yourself. <laughs> so again, sales skills will never go to waste. You know, you are always selling yourself, even if you're not an entrepreneur or even if you're not technically a salesperson. Like yeah. you just always, you know, and the more comfortable you get with it. And again, look, 16 years and I still blew like, you know, the beginning of that first conversation. <laughs> not a deterrent, right? That's a that's a difference that 16 years gives you. Like some people would be like, okay, I'm just going to leave. No, like I was going to stand behind that guy until he turned around. And again, I just wanted five minutes, right? And I just wanted him to remember me. And like, not in a bad way. I was, you know, I was very conscious of his space, you know, and then when it was appropriate, I kind of like, you know, muscled my way in and, you know, quick conversation, let's follow up next week. And then I was out. Right. And that's yeah. what you have to do as a salesperson. Like, you know, just get the, you have to just get the ball rolling any way you can. And I think that's one of the greatest thing about Nifty is that we definitely think like the entrepreneurial mindset, right? It's just the mindset. Even if you don't own your business, you're still going to like work for someone or do something. And so I think that it really is just about the mindset that you have. And you're right. You are your own business. You are your own brand. And mm -hmm. so this was, has all been wonderful. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, and we we're this is it this is this is the end of this incredible webinar and what a way to end uh, today's session please join us for the next time may 9th and so for the continuation of this incredible series but thank you all so much for joining us thank you so much heather for this incredible like conversation and just really all these great tips and tricks for for next and i promise that i will definitely start as a millennial starting to like call more often i'm gonna i'm gonna start working on that <laughs> but thank you so much have a great rest of your day and until next time thank you okay great thank you bye-bye